until you settle. God, 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 I can't hear nobody. Every now and again, God won't unleash everything that he has for you just to step back and watch. Will you lower your standard of expectation because God didn't operate on your timetable? Or will you still believe if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. This is chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. Of course he did. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah took his wife, uh, Sarah his wife took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. You may be seated. As that you'll arm yourself with a writing instrument, there are some points and principles, some keys that I want to give you that I believe will serve you long after this day is over. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. I'm going to preach using as a subject today, I can't settle down. I can't settle down. Cable television is now akin to electronic oxygen. And these days, nobody asks you, do you have cable? We just assume that you do. Even if you don't have a television, it's necessary if you desire access to the internet. The only real question becomes, who is your carrier? Comcast, Verizon, Dish, or DirecTV? Last year, one commercial sparked a civil war within the cable industry. It was geniusly hatched by DirecTV to disrupt the market share. The message, which had no subtlety, was that anybody who remained with cable, instead of switching to DirecTV, was nothing more than a settler. The 60-second satire shows a scrawny boy with a hapless look the father riding a tractor trailer in the front yard and the daughter playing with a doll that has no face. The father says to his family, we are settlers and that's who we are. Referencing as to why it is that they are still on standard cable. They embrace being settlers in a technological era. The loophole to the logic, although it's captivating, is how is it that direct TV is better? And the ad, regrettably, lends no insight. Such is the real burden with said light, is that you begin to believe that nothing better is available, that nothing greatable, greater is achievable, but I came this morning just to let you know that God's got something better in store for you. Not just for you. He's got something better in store for your entire family. If you believe that greater is coming, would you give God a sound of thanksgiving? What's bone chilling is that the whole notion, hear this, of being a settler 
originates with American Christians. The first settlers to inhabit this nation came to a city now known as Jamestown, Virginia. They were lifelong members of the Church of England. Before settling, setting sail, they had to take an oath acknowledging the supremacy of the king and the absence of the authority of the Pope over him. As soon as they arrived in 1607, the first thing they did was construct a place of worship. They did that before they could establish wealth. The top was made from the sail of the ship, stretching over the tops of the trees. Benches were hewn out of tree trunks, and the altar was fused from two logs. A year later, in 1608, a fire swept through that small fledgling colony and destroyed their makeshift church. And as it would turn out a year later in 1608, they constructed a church that looked like the first one they made in 1607. The critical question that I have to ask you is after you've gone through fire, shouldn't you worship differently? After you've been through something a year of struggling, shouldn't your mind be in a different place? And yet these settlers, even after surviving fire, made up in their minds they wanted to worship God the exact same way they did after the fire than they did before. Going through something ought to make you worship God differently. And I want to say to somebody, maybe the person behind you, after what you endured last year, there's no way in the world you should be worshiping God the exact same this year. Those of you who have not endured fire, I pity you. But those of you that came through it smelling like a rose, you ought to be thankful unto God that God has given you another opportunity just to give him praise and glory. While all of us understand that we shouldn't settle for less than what we want or what we deserve, very few of us actually go for more. Most of us settle. The problem is many of us are pressured to settle even when we have a drive to soar. A brilliant young high schooler who uh, is a member of our church I was talking to just a few Sundays ago and I was conversing with her and she was sharing with me that she was accepted into six colleges. Being accepted into six colleges, I asked her to name to me what were the six colleges, Sophia, that she was accepted to and she told me one of them was the University of Maryland at Baltimore. I inquired of her, did you apply to College Park? You got a 3.7 GPA. Did you apply to College Park? And she responded to me, no, because I didn't want to risk rejection. And I knew that University of, Bal University of Maryland at Baltimore would be easier for me to get into because everybody wanted College Park. The great temptation of settling is trying to avoid being challenged. The problem with settling is that settling makes you settle for convenience when God never called you to that which is convenient or comfortable, but you always have to go after the obstacle. Faith is synonymous with risk. If it is safe, it is not from God. You have to dream at such a level that you know if God doesn't get involved, it's going to fail. But the reason why I know it's going to work is because I am resolved that if God be for me, who can be against me? And I don't know whether you realize it or not, but you are sitting around people who refuse to live safe.
that they understand I've got to now take off the life preserver jack jacket and I just got to go for it and if I perish let me perish but I cannot live in a safety zone when God is calling me to a level of excellence Lori Gottlieb wrote a book that is absolutely intriguing and entertaining Lori Gottlieb wrote a book entitled Marry Him the case for settling for Mr. Good Enough. The case for settling for Mr. Good Enough. The question is debated whether it's better to be alone or to settle. I want to unpack for you three reasons as to why people settle. I want you to write these down, please. Three reasons as to why people settle. The first reason, I want you to write this down. The first reason is finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Settling is safe. Would you write this down, please? Settling is, is safe and going after it is a gamble. Settling is safe and going after it is a gamble. There's always the chance you won't find true love. Amos Trotsky demonstrated the economic principle called loss aversion, which suggests losing $100 feels worse than gaining $100 feels good. But there's something in our psychosis that we would rather avoid a $5 surcharge then gain a $5 discount, which supports the fact that we tend to avoid loss when it comes to relationships, hear this, that may even be mediocre. So I would rather stay on an average job than start a business and find out the consequence. We like keeping our foot on the base because there is something in us that has an aversion to the unknown. Why are you staying? Because I'm comfortable being unhappy. So I already know what I get with this. Then trying something else and seeing if God has something better behind door number two. Do you know how many people die miserable because they want to keep their foot on second base? And they have no idea that the home plate is right around the corner. The first reason why people settle is finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Here's the second one. I want you to write this down. The second reason why people settle is hide and go seek. People sometimes aspire towards perfectionism in a partner at the cost of missing potential. So we will eliminate potential suitors based off of height, based off of weight, based off of hair, based off of career, even, watch this, without the mildest consideration about, here it is, kindness. Nothing about spirituality. Nothing about support. I'm so caught on how they dress that I don't even realize that their self-esteem is naked. But I want to know what kind of car that they have. And I never take the due diligence to discover, do they have drive? You're excited about the fact that they have a degree, but they have no ambition. So you keep missing it because you like people on paper, but can't handle who they are in real life. So many of us are hide from what's not obvious and seek after what's superficial. Can I take it a step further, even at the risk of being offensive in church? Woe unto you if you get somebody who's spiritual but not sane. Yeah, I know you can pray, but can you have a conversation? I know you know the word of God. Do you read anything outside of the Bible? 
I know you have communion, but can you cook? It's got to be some level of balance in what it is that I pursue. The third reason, I want you to write this down. What is the first reason? Come on, 730. What's the second reason? Here's the third reason. Write this down. Playing solitaire. A recent study found that people who are afraid of being single will misappropriate being in a relationship over being in a quality relationship. I think y'all missed that. Can I give it to you again? People who are afraid of being alone will sacrifice being in a quality relationship just to say they're in a relationship. Loneliness is prone to make you go for lower quality. That's the best thing I done said all day. I'm telling you, preach Jamal, I'm doing the best I can. Loneliness is prone to make you go for lower quality. The reality is that the depression from loneliness is just as painful as the depression from unhappiness. Is, is, is this on? I said the same depression you feel from loneliness is the same depression you will experience from unhappiness. That's why there are a whole lot of married people who wish they were single. And a whole lot of single people who think that they should be married because they don't understand the depression is the same. Michelle Obama said during the Democratic Convention, when they go low, we got to go high. And I'm trying to figure out why it is that so many of us feel as if company is the prescription for loneliness when you keep selecting an over-the-counter drug. Many times, your friends, your family members, when they pick somebody or you see them with somebody and you've been trying to figure out, how did they get together? In the back of your mind, you guys say, Lord, they must be lonely. <laughs> Just look straight ahead, please. Let's go to the word of God. Can you turn to Genesis chapter 15? In Genesis chapter 15, the Lord made a promise to Abraham. You are not going to lose what you worked so hard for. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the whole premise of the narrative. Na Abraham, you have, in fact, built an incredible business. You have, in fact, created a thriving enterprise. You are, in fact, accumulating massive wealth. And I am not going to let it go squandered to strangers. I am going to so bless you that you have something to leave for your children. Some of y'all just missed the prophecy. Let me back that thing up and give it to you again. God told me to tell you that I am not going to let you just work a nine to five job, work 40 years just for a watch, and you have no inheritance. I am not blessing you just to pay bills. I am blessing you so that your children will not know the degree and the level of struggle that you have become acclimated to. I I am going to so bless you that your latter years are going to be better than your former years. I am going to so bless you that the days that stuff was tight for you will be a foreign reality to your children that it will seem so bizarre that even when you talk about it, they'll won't believe your testimony. I am so anointing you that the things that you had to live without your children
children will always live with I speak over every person who is in this room that the days that you had to make the sacrifices that your children don't understand to this hour that when it is that your children's 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 children rise up and read through your family history they will know they have what they have because of the decisions you made because of the choices you elected because of the prayers that you prayed I speak blessings over your grandchildren and over your great grandchildren I speak it can I make it practical that your children will never have to fill out applications for student loans I speak over your great grandchildren that they will never see what an eviction notice looks like unless they are putting people out of their rental property I speak over your children's life that they will never be in small claims court they'll never have to fight over child support they'll never have to figure about utilities I speak over your children's life that there will always be food in the refrigerator always be heat in the house and always be a roof over their head I speak over your children's life that they will pursue their passion not because they need the money but because they understand that there's a call over their life I break the cycle of poverty over your family that you are the last of the Mohicans nobody else in your family will ever have the physical weight of financial strain that you have had to endure and the blessed people of God that receive wealth over your family you ought to shout about it like God is able he said watch this I am producing in your family an heir Y'all don't know how to shout. I am going to raise up somebody in your family that can manage wealth. I do not want you to raise and work that hard and the next generation of children in your family blow what you worked on. The devil is a lie. But God said, if you give me glory, I am now anointing your children to be able to manage property, to be able to manage portfolios, to be disciplined in their spending, to be able to handle the blessings of the Lord that maketh rich and add no sorrow to it. The Lord said, all of this that you've done, I am not going to leave this to a stranger. Somebody in your family is going to get this. Hallelujah, I feel it right here. I said somebody in your family is going to get this. I got to pause. I just feel the Holy Ghost arresting me in this moment. I don't know where y'all are and I don't even know who this is for. But I just need 15 of you to give God glory for your grandchildren. God, I can't hear anybody else. Y'all really ain't going to say anything? I, I, I just felt that right there. I said, open up your mouth because your grandchildren are going to do better than your children. I need you to open up your mouth like, God, I need you to entrust them for excellence. And the Lord said to, um, Lord said to Abraham, you will produce an heir who will be able to manage wealth, who will be able to do kingdom building, who will be able to handle the full scope of your portfolio. And something amazing happened. Is that time elapsed and nothing was produced. I'm talking to somebody who's in this room, somebody who's watching online, where God promised you something. And it's been a minute since he said it. And you ain't seen nothing. God help me. And folk don't understand how you keeping it together. And you're trying not to lose your hope. Trying not to lose your faith. 
trying not to give up hallelujah but can I tell you he may not come when you want him to come but, but he's an on time God I, I'm getting ready to kill a devil right through here I, I want you to worship watch this not for the blessing you have here's your shout would you worship God for the blessing you wait no for, for, for the blessing that he promised you I, I don't have it yet but God don't know how to lie if he told me it's got to come to pass and time passes and he sees nothing nothing happens nothing happens went out on that word that God gave him and um, made a nursery at the house nothing happened every month Abraham's wife never missed a cycle nothing happened people at the church keep asking y'all ain't got kids yet <laughs> nothing happened his in-laws want to know, what's wrong with you? And nothing happens. Only a few people in this room know the frustration of having to wait on God. God says, my, my, my promise is not a carton of milk. There's no expiration date on it. I don't move on your time. When, when, when I know you're ready is when I release it. God, I feel like I'm talking to somebody. And, and somebody, if you don't remember nothing else I told you this morning, I need you to remember this. God told me to tell you, it's almost your time. God, did y'all hear what your pastor just said? I said, it's almost your time. Those of y'all that are not waiting on a move of God, don't shout with us. But those of you that need God to do something specific in the life of my family, in the life of my body, in the life of my marriage, God, I need you to show me something. Turn the page. I'm now in Genesis chapter 16. And in Genesis chapter 16, Sarah gets frustrated. Sarah gets frustrated. Look at Genesis 16. Would you look at verse 2? It's going to blow your mind. Genesis 16, verse number 2. Watch what Sarah says with her spiritual maturity, discernment, and insight. She says, watch this, the Lord is stopping me from producing. This ain't the devil. I ain't under spiritual warfare. I ain't under attack. The Lord won't let me produce. Hallelujah. Y'all, I knew y'all weren't going to like this. And, and, and maybe, just maybe, God holds back some stuff. Just to see in your season of waiting, will you settle? God, 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 I can't hear nobody. Every now and again, God won't unleash everything that he has for you just to step back and watch. Will you lower your standard of expectation because God didn't operate on your timetable? Or will you still believe? If God said it, I believe it. And that settles it. So Sarah says, um, God doing this to me. And have you ever thought, even in, in the Rolodex of your own memories, that sometimes when I'm not being productive, it's because God won't let me. And what is the lesson that God is trying to teach while I'm waiting? You, you, you don't need faith for stuff that comes quick. God, yeah. <laughs> did you hear what I just said? You don't need faith for stuff that comes immediately. You need faith for what you are waiting for. And Sarah fails the test. 
She fails the test by offering to Abraham. She says to Abraham, go get my slave. Because I'm tired of waiting. Watch this. I need you to hear the language. I'm tired of waiting for God to work through me. Because he ain't working through me. Hey, go get my slave. And I want to caution you. That impatience will put you in chains. You cannot settle for something that will enslave you. Oh God, help me. For, her, for him to go get Hagar, he's got to go to slave quarters. And many of you are mis messing up your assignment and call from God because you keep going to where the slaves are. God, I can't hear nobody. And so now, chains look sexy. God, 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 I can't hear nobody. In case y'all forgot, a slave can't think, a slave can't read, and a slave is afraid to make a move. Whenever you are connected to somebody who is enslaved, here it is, they cannot read the handwriting on the wall that this too shall pass. A slave is always scared to make a move and waiting on somebody's permission to authorize and validate their humanity. But when you are free, you understand, I don't need your permission in order to dream outside of the box. I, I don't need you to validate who it is that God has put on my life. And aren't you tired of being connected to a slave? You keep falling in love and sleeping with slaves. God, y'all. Hallelujah. They, they got no capacity to beyond, believe that there's something beyond their present existence. But you don't even know this morning you sitting beside a runaway slave. Because God had to get them away from somebody they were bound to. Because had they stayed with that, their whole life would have been jacked up. But God said, he that the sun sets free is free indeed. They wait 10 years on God to move. And in 10 years, God does nothing. And so the only, only thing Abraham can do, and did I neglect to tell you, Abraham, watch this empowerment, Abraham is the father of faith. So far, nobody believes at the level Abraham believes. And with all of that faith, y'all ain't gonna like it. I'm telling you, only the last three rows are gonna get it. With all that faith, Abraham ends up sleeping with somebody not on his level. Oh, God, help me. Settling happens many times for church people. God, help me, who really don't believe that God has something better in store. And because you're going against some imaginary, invisible, biological clock, you think, if I don't get on this last train to Paris, it ain't another bus coming. I can't hear nobody. But you got to make up in your mind, if God brought me this far, he didn't bring me this far to be with some Sambo who don't even know their head from their elbow. I need God to give me somebody that knows how to think for themselves and dream for themselves and believe for themselves. So in this season of your life, with everything that you are designed and anointed to accomplish, you don't need a slave, you need a slayer. Oh God, hear me. Whatsoever I loose in heaven shall be loosed in earth. And whatsoever I bind in the earth shall be bound in heaven. I need you to look at the person beside you and tell them don't get it twisted. Hallelujah. You ain't sitting beside no slave this morning. You sitting beside a slayer. 
I know how to cast down. I know how to pull down. I know how to bind up. I don't know who you used to, but I need you to know sitting next to me, you ain't going down. You only going up from here. And I need you, those of you that know one day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And that's why I know it was the blood that saved me. So many times we shout for blessings, but you don't operate in the full authority that you have. Look at your neighbor, tell him I'm a slayer. Hallelujah. Tell him I don't play with this thing. There's a gift on my life. And when I worship God this morning, it ain't for nothing material or tangible. But I'm getting ready to slay every demon. I'm going to slay every witch and every warlock and every curse that's been messing with your mind and messing with your expectation. Look at your neighbor say, you ain't got to shout. I'm used to working by myself. When I praise God, I'm pulling down everything that tried to pull you down. When I lift up God, I'm lifting off of you every weight that's been on your chest and been on your mind. If you know you got that kind of power, would you stop pulling it down? I pull down depression. I pull down stress. I pull down anxiety. Because if God be for me, who? Hallelujah. Lift up that hand, please. Benjamin Elijah Mays, the former president of Morehouse College, he said that your greatest sin is not failure. Your greatest sin is low aim. Did you hear what I just said? Lift that hand. I said your greatest sin is not failure. Your greatest sin is low aim. You don't dream the size of God. You dream the size of your pain. You dream the size of your experience. And your experience has now dictated your expectation. I want you to lift that hand because I believe God's got something bigger for you. The anointing of Jabez is on your life. You didn't hear what I just said. I said the anointing of Jabez is now on your life. Pastor, what does that mean? I speak over every lifted hand that God is now enlarging your territory. I can't hear nobody. I'm telling you that God is getting ready to enlarge everything you presently have. And everything that you've been going for. I want you to lift that hand, please. God, please only connect me to people who are free in their mind who won't try to talk me out of my dream but will encourage me in my dream I pray dear Lord that you'll surround me with people who don't mind reading I need you to surround me with critical thinkers who don't look at what it is but look at what it can be Thank you, dear Lord, that the shackles are coming off of my expectation. I want more from you this year than what I got last year. God, thank you that you've given me the fire to believe that even after the fire, I can rebuild. That I can start life all over again. This is the year I walk into my wealthy place. That everything that I'm supposed to have is going to come to me and it's going to come by a sweatless victory. And those of you who have the faith enough to believe God for stuff that's risky. That if God doesn't get involved, it's not going to work. If that's who you are, that's where you are. I need you to give God glory for the blessings you believe are coming to your children. Come on, clap your hands for the blessings that are coming to your nieces, to your nephews. The blessings that are coming to your godchildren, to your grandchildren. If you're not selfish, would you clap for the blessings that's coming to your best friend's children? <laughs> 